Thank you for coming and spending your Saturday nights, or well, at least the beginning of your Saturday night, with myself. My name is Paul McFay. I forgot to introduce myself to the day. Just thought I'd give it a try this time. Hello, I'm a writer and I've founded the London Short Story Festival um, and um, I've written a novel as well. And and like um, our two uh, stars of the evening, um, Kit Deval and Neve Campbell, they short story writers who are also novelists, which is not always the case. In fact, I think I find that quite rare. I think novelists are often really scared of the short story. And some short story writers really are scared of the novel. Or, or uh, And so that would be an interesting um, conversation tonight to, to ask you about what how those processes differ, for example, in your writing. So um, I thought it would be nice, instead of me sort of reading my the, the bio I got printed out, that I would... Um, let um, our writers uh, introduce themselves and um, uh, choose what they would like to share with you. Um, so I'm going to ask, because you're next to me on the wee sort of Brady Bunch thing. Um, Kit, could you introduce yourself, please, to everyone? Hello, it's lovely to be here. Um, thank you for coming along on Saturday night to another Zoom. Um, my name's Kit Duval. I live... I'm. Irish woman, but I live in England. Um, and I came to writing quite late. I had my first novel published when I was 56. I write short stories and flash fiction. And I have my most recent work is a, a short story collection called Supporting Cast. And I also very occasionally write screenplays. And I've just had a bit of a screenplay on telly called The Third Day. Don't know if anyone saw it, um, but I wrote episode, episodes four and five of The Third Day. That was very exciting. First time I've seen my name on a screen next to Jude Laws. Um, so, yes, I, I, I will write anything I think I can execute. Uh, that means I will never write poetry because that is a bridge too far. I'm, I wouldn't be good, and I think that's such an art that I can't do but short stories flash fiction novels yes brilliant thank you thank you uh Neve, would you um do us the honor yes thank you everyone for coming this evening um it's very nice to see all your names and or photographs my name is Neve. I'm a I'm a researcher and a writer of fiction and I'm a precarious academic uh, but I have all written a, my first book is actually a monograph about the writer John McGahern, which I was my PhD. So I actually sort of played in a tribute band for four years and I did nothing but John McGahern writing. So it's a, it's a small niche book, but I love it dearly. And that was actually my first publication. And then I kind of moved on. And uh, my novel, my first novel, This Happy, came out in June. And uh, shortly afterwards, I won the Sunday Time Short Story Competition, which is what gives me the authority to be here today. Although I write a lot more long fiction than I write short stories. And I don't consider myself to be a particularly talented short story writer, which sounds like I'm just saying that so people will give me praise. But it's genuinely true. That was the fluke. I feel like a scholar of the short story and I have a lot of admiration for people who do it more often. I actually think it's extremely difficult. So just to get that out of the way. Um, I write nonfiction sometimes. Um, I sort of have a weird relationship with nonfiction in that I, I like to do it, but it's not maybe, I don't know. Anyway, the reason why I say that is because the most recent thing I have in the ether at the moment is a nonfiction piece I wrote about doing tarot cards. I, sort of, that I, I like to do it at Ease Illuminations Gallery, which you can find online at the moment. So I have a scholarly and creative overlap interest in... Um, uh, archetypes I suppose which is where the tarot comes in and uh, in human psychology as represented in artistic archetypes or aesthetic archetypes so that's something I'm very committed to and across all kinds of writing that I do um yeah so that's me thank you for having you, me Neve, did you just say that you read tarot cards like I mean, you actually do that. Yeah, at the moment, it's looking like because of what seems to be a crossed wire in RTE, I might be on the Brendan O'Connor show doing tarot cards next week. <laughs> I, I would never refuse a gig. 
So far, I have never refused to give. <laughs> I mean, do you want any punters? Because I'm, I bet you there'll be a couple of people here that would... Um... Probably, but I did. I've never done it for money or done it for other people. Oh, I just do it okay. myself. I have. I just do my own tarot. It's like a, a magic eight ball I shake every day, but it's gone quite... It's gotten out of hand. It's something so. else. <laughs> I mean. oh, no, no. And actually, that, that just sort of reminds me of your story, which won the, the prize, because you met, you mentioned Alistair Crowley and the, and, and the occult. And so there's, there's got to be a link there, yes? Very that, much. It's, it's like a, a long-running research interest that I haven't brought to consummation yet. I got a postdoc to look into this for two years and didn't write anything other than one article. And it's very hard to argue for sort of mysticism in academic writing. It's very hard to get that through peer review, but I'm working on it. So, yeah, I sometimes express it in a side project that's creative, which is more hospitable to the slightly mystical. OK, um, I'm loving all this because when I when I was a wee boy, um, I was just obsessed with people like Alistair Crowley and the occult and and, um, and I used to order them from the library and hide them under my bed, you know, and um, and read them and read them. I absolutely loved it. And uh, I watched a lot of films I shouldn't have, but it mm. um, didn't do me any harm. But um, uh, so I'll be looking forward to see how that, how that influences your work as, as, as it progresses. Um, Kit, I was wondering, I was thinking it's quite, always quite nice, I think, to start an event with some uh, readings because I think it just sets a really nice tone. And, um, and I know that your um, collection, which you'll be hearing more about later on, has um, pieces of varying lengths. You know, there's yeah. some that are almost like flash on, really. And, and then there's the longer stories and stories that you've had on Radio 4, et cetera, as well. Um, we're going to hear more, a bit more about it, but you're going to read, I think, a complete yeah. piece, is that right? A complete piece, yeah. It's yeah. about, uh, oh, it's very short, very short piece. Um, and it's called Crazy Rose. Uh, it's a, a character from a, a different novel that I wrote. And Crazy Rose is an old woman. That's all you need to know. Crazy Rose, 91, Morecambe Crescent, October 2018. He brings blossom in April, perfume in the summer, scents of sizzling meat from nearby gardens, and sometimes he carries music that makes her close her eyes and press her heart. He brings her little presents, scraps of things that he eddies from the street into her porch, a chocolate wrapper, a pigeon feather, faded print. Without him, no one would call. It's late morning when she opens the front door to see what he's brought her. He blusters in. What have we today? She asks. She gathers up his offerings and sits by the fire. There's always something to make her smile. A polystyrene carton smells of sour fish. He has tumbled it all the way from town, from a young man who drank late with his friends, who laughed with his mouth full, who kissed a girl with vinegar fingers and loved her that night. There is also a letter, 10 words of it, unfinished, written in ink, screwed up, small footprints on the back. Dear Faith, it reads, I'm writing to say sorry if you would just... She goes to the door again to see if he has brought the rest, but there's nothing. And that night, before she goes to bed, she hears him rattling the letterbox, strong fingers on the sash windows. She only has half the story, so she'll have to be patient. She folds the letter in half and tucks it between the magazines and books in the paper mountain behind her chair. But this summer he hardly visits and her house is quiet. Her dinners are delivered and a young man comes and holds her hand. They want to look after her, he says, and make room for her in Holly Lodge. But he doesn't tell her what Holly Lodge is. And he doesn't come back. She's alone again. Then one day, the wind is back with his October gift, hidden under a free newspaper. Two golden leaves holding hands at the stem. The colour of warm sand, tipped with blood red, spots of green that have refused to fade. She holds them up to the light, traces their thin veins, useless now, carrying nothing. 
She'll dry them out by the gas fire until they turn crisp and brittle and crumble in her hand. She begins to worry about winter when he cries a lot and gets angry, blows the slates off the roof, howls too long and keeps her awake. But at least he's a bit of company. And she turns to look around the room at his many little gifts and she remembers the half letter that came in the spring. Dear Faith. She's careful when she stands, careful when she tugs bits of paper from the mountain, careful when she steadies its lean. It starts with a little shudder and the slide of old magazines from the top that land on her shoulder and end at her feet. Then a dozen cereal boxes, ones that flattened and folded and carefully stowed. Then a car magazine and a poster for a missing cat. Then a flyer for labour. And then the slippery slide of papers and pages of colourful coupons and offers from the new supermarket that she's never seen, a walk and a bus journey away. And then a tumble. And then an avalanche. And the mountain groans and shifts and bullies her backwards until she's standing on the leaves and singeing the back of her skirt. The gas fire whispers and tells her to be careful. And just as she's about to turn it off, in he comes, a whisper at first, then a rattle of the glass, and then a whoosh, and a quick dance around the mountain, and he's alive, yellow and white now, blue when he catches the paper, red where he curls the plastic, hot and wild, filling the room with his crackles and hisses and his thick grey breath. She opens wide. He fills her throat, devours her. Thank you. Thank you. Kids, um, what, what really struck me is that I, I, I hadn't heard of this um, uh, idea that you came up with for your collection before. I thought it was very unique and original. And I just wondered if you would share it with us, like where, where it came from and, and describe how you came, how sure. it came about. And... Um, well, the, the, the title of the book is called Supporting Cast. And it's um, stories about all the B, not all the B characters, some of the B characters from my two novels, My Name is Leon, and um, The Trick to Time. And it's really the characters that I hadn't finished with. It's the, the characters that I had loved and invested time in. And I wanted to talk about what happened to them. Sometimes the stories are about them before they ever appear in the story. Sometimes it's a story about them contemporary to them appearing in my novel. And sometimes like this one, Crazy Rose, in my name is Leon. Crazy Rose is a woman of about 40. She's just a, a friend of Maureen who looks after Leon, a friend of Sylvia. Uh, but now she's an old lady and it's about what happens to her. So it's really me indulging my love of character, basically, because all some of these stories are a page long. Some of them are 3,000 words long. And it's just me talking to them and allowing them to talk to me and say what happened and, and what happened to them after the book finished or what happened to them before. And it was an absolute joy, absolute joy. I mean, just... I wrote it for me, you know, I loved, I loved doing it. And do you, do, have you had that experience where you're at an event and someone comes up to you and says, you know, whatever happened to Leon? Yeah. Whatever happened to this character? And, you know, I really think about that. And I actually had someone write that to me today, you know, like, I think whatever happened to the little, you know, it's all, oh, you know, yeah. do you, did you get that when you're, Yes. With, yeah. And yeah. I get. I, and you know, it's, it's really in response to that, and it's because I can always tell them. You know, if if they take the most minor character in any of my books, I would tell them exactly what happened to the to <laughs> people. They're not. No one's got a walk-on part. No one's got a walk-on part in their own life. You mm. know, everybody, the most minor person. You're the most important person in your life, um, and. So I wanted that to be reflected in, in my writing that, you know, like I say, there's no B characters in your own life. You're, you're the main event. And then other people are the B characters. And so it goes and so it goes. So I really wanted to give just a little bit of time and space to some of the people in 
my novels that look like walk-on characters. I mean, Crazy Rose has probably got 12 lines uh, in, in My Name is Leon, not even that many. Um, but she was very real oh. to me and what she was doing. Um, would you like to uh, read for a little bit for us, please? Yes. Yeah, so this is the um, first section of uh, Love Many. That November, I'd press against the dead weight of depression, of a broken heart, the post-broken heart universe ringing tepidly with rain and downloaded Tinder. I went on a date with an American who said, I could put my hands around your waist. And then when the wine list came, pointed to the wine list and squeaked, halfsies? I went on a date with a man from Cork who had lived in Boston for one year and acquired an accent so accurate and bulletproof I could not believe he was really from Cork. This man also had a low lisp, which made much of what he said sound malevolent and sexually exciting. He rented an extraordinary apartment near the Pepper Canister Church, a section of a converted townhouse with a high ceiling that scrunched at the centre in a vortex of plaster garlands. The sash windows opened onto the fire escape and the Boston Corconian sat in a chair, smoking out of the window, holding forth. By two in the morning, I felt exhausted and deranged by his strange monologue. I lay on my face and proceeded for the rest of the night to play dead. I went on a date with the man and let me pay for both copies and then said, I'll get you back sometime. I went on four dates with a thought-tormented programmer from St. Petersburg, who was, he told me, looking for a wife, but could not understand how women worked. He had a graceful and melancholy physique, like an expensive musical instrument. I went on dates with scrofulous Irish boys who had bags of laundry at the feet of their beds, one bar of palm olive soap in the shower tray. I went on dates with imported Google and Facebook workers at Grand Canal Dock, goofy Italians and sardonic Georgians and play-fighting French. They knew about cheese and collecting vinyl and seemed so absurdly uncomplicated I could not find a use for them. I went on a date with the editor of an anti-establishment magazine who chided me when I told him I had just bought tea for a homeless man. The homeless man had looked at me and said in a whine of wet teas, could you not get me some sweets? I went on a date with a nice man I kept meeting at plays afterwards, only ever plays. Then I went on a date with Timothy. It was a Friday night, dark and cold out with a clear shot of the stars. I asked him to meet me in Fallon and Burn, thinking of the wine bar in the basement, but when I arrived, he was sitting with his jacket on in the deli cafe, which was closing. A waitress of bending bar stools and cellophane stretched across bowls of couscous and potato salad. He was texting and pouring idly from a pot of peppermint tea. He was spry, but surprisingly attractive, with curly hair, combat boots and dark eyes. And when he turned to me in introduction, he scrunched up his face. I don't much like this place, he said. Can we go somewhere else? Yes, but not far, I cautioned, pointing to my stiletto heels. I like those, Timothy said to the shoes. We found a hotel bar on the corner so crowded we had to sit in plastic-backed chairs around defanged banquet tables in the corridor, daring one another to complain. I said, sparkling water, please. And he said, sure, sparkling water for two. And so neither of us even had a proper drink in the well-lit lobby, leaning over laps on plastic chairs. I was wearing my passive-aggressive first date ensemble of plain blouse and faded jeans, with no jewellery and a plaque of lipstick, pillar box red. We spoke competitively about the occult. Timothy told me an apocryphal anecdote about Alistair Crowley, who had persuaded someone, an acolyte apparently, that you could find money by walking around and training your eyes to the ground. To keep at it, if you could, would mean money in hand within days. Have you tried it out? I asked. I did for a bit, he said, but you could go mad, couldn't you? I tipped back to laugh then, surrendering at last, and he smiled because he'd succeeded in making me laugh. I'll tell you what I'm doing this weekend, he said, looking about, but you might think it's strange. Go ahead. I'm going to a farmhouse in the back of beyond to take psychedelics as part of a ceremony. That, I said candidly, is the coolest thing I've ever heard. I'll leave it there. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. And this story, I mean, you, you can read this story online. Um, you could. It's been paywalled in the last month. Ah, okay, right. Because I, I, I was, I know you sent it to me, but I was, I, I was looking online today. I could say, oh, read the story, click. But I don't know. I didn't click on, so I don't know. But I, th- I think it was certainly an extract anyway that you can read. I think because it was, it was on screen when I looked at it. Um, so you, I mean, quite um, interesting story that you told at the beginning, which is that you don't really consider yourself a short story writer, and that this story, um, though winning the um, the biggest uh, prize for a single short story in the world. Um, uh, that you you consider it a fluke, and that um, um, could you tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, you know, how, how did you come about? How did you come to writing a short story if it's not something that you normally do? So for, let's start there. Um, I was right. Most short things that I write are part of a sequences or a, a sort of set of sketches. When I'm writing a novel, I do sketches, so I do character sidebars, and I kind of spend time with the characters, and I'll scrap a lot of it. And this was one of the ones that got scrapped from a manuscript that I was working on. And it was so self-contained, I thought, as I usually do quite um, pragmatically, this could stand alone as a short piece. And I'm quite committed to putting out short pieces as much as I can because it's so lovely to get readers. And when you're writing novels, you go for two or three years, potentially without having, like, without talking to anybody. So I thought I, I'll, I'll use this. And it just went from there. I went to the Dublin Review with it. Dublin Review bought it. And then I forgot about it because I didn't publish it for a long time. And then at the beginning of the year, I got an email from Brendan Barrington saying, um, would, you should maybe submit this to the Sunday Times. And I didn't think I wouldn't have done it otherwise. So yeah, it was, um, that's how it came to be a story. It was not written as a short story. It was written as part of a sequence. So it was a set piece originally, and then it got topped and tailed and turned into a story. So it, it won't appear in a novel? No, that, that, whole, that whole thing is gone. That oh, sequence will never yeah. light a day. So this is the only remaining bit of that sequence. They say good writing is never wasted. So that's a perfect example, isn't it? You know, so don't, don't, never worry about cutting out stuff because you know you can always uh, yeah, recycle yeah. it, if that's the right term. And uh, and I was thinking about um, uh, this idea of when your collection comes out. When your collection comes out, I know that it's for me, uh, you're focused on writing novels, um, but you're now. I mean, I know you you had work in um, Five Dials and Tangerine and Dublin Review and um, Banshee, Gorse. I mean, three. You know, so you're kind of building this uh, collection up, um, and I'm wondering, will we see it because of the nature of them being sort of outtakes or or cuts? Would it would it appear so almost like a kind of um, a, a novel that has a, a, about the same character or same types of character that are sort of populating the, the collection? That be- I don't know if I want to do that. Um, it's sort of an accident that, that, that there has been this, um, this continuum between them because they were, they were sketches. And a lot of the ones that I do at the moment and that are upcoming, there's one coming out in some such, um, are studies of the of characters from the next, from the novel that I'm doing now. So, I think I would probably wait a good few years so that there would be some variety because I'm assuming I'll mature as an artist. I feel like I've kind of done what I can do at this point and I need to wait a few years and maybe I, I'll put some stuff out that's not studies of the same thing. Um, so it'll probably be a long time before there's a collection. Um, but there will be, they will have relationship. It's interesting that, Kit, I thought it was really interesting that you brought out a book which was your your side characters because yeah. that is very much how I feel about short pieces as well. So it's actually really great to see a writer just be like, that's an okay way to proceed. They're yeah. character studies. They're, yeah. they're channeled off into this interest. I don't sit down and think... I'm going to write a short story in the style of Alice Munro or I'm going to do the technique. It doesn't, I never look at it like that. So that's why I think I'm not a real short story writer. It's just, it's little, it's little funnels off of the main. Well, I, I think that is, that's, you know, whether, I mean, you're definitely a short story writer. You're definitely, definitely a short story writer, but there's no one way to be a short story writer. You know, you just short pieces, once you're writing short pieces and you've got more than one, you're a short story writer, even if you only ever had one. Because I think what 
what they are are glimpses of life. Some, some short stories are beginning, middle and end and they follow the novel structure and they're really, you know, self-contained. And then you have got some short story pieces that are a, a moment in someone's life, almost like a poem, but it's just a moment that tells you something about someone without that sort of formal, in the beginning, then this happened and that's the end. Um, and I, I love those pieces. I think they, they can tell you that. so much about someone. Yeah. You, know, you don't need to know the beginning, middle and end. Sometimes you just see someone do something. I think the same thing. And that's how I've always I sort of intuitively felt about short stories. And I think the, the reason why I didn't expect to win the, the competition is because I felt like there's a sort of short story formula, which is, yeah. which is rewarded in the era of creative writing masters, for example. And I don't do that. And it's not like I can't do it. I'm not interested enough in it to do it. So I assumed it wouldn't win because it didn't correlate to this yeah. kind of like money shot story where you get your, da, da, da. but the payoff, but the payoff. Yeah. And I mean, I, every time I read a story like that, I always think I admire that, but I'm not really sure I enjoyed it. Just yeah. me personally, I don't think it's very interesting, but it is sort of, it's almost like people gaming the publishing industry by thinking I can do this trick again and again. Um, but so it was, it was really, for me, obviously I was surprised to win. I was really pleased to win, but I also thought, you know, there's some validity to my approach then, which is just kind of like, as you say, it's a moment or it's just a, a study. It's a, it's one yeah. interest it's kind of, maybe you can't really understand why you're so interested in that character. It just is. And uh, yeah, that's an, I, I prefer to see it that way. So, Neve, when you, um, I mean, I, I'm entering competitions, I mean, I know a lot of um, uh, people that come along to events at, at festivals, um, are writers themselves or emerging writers or um, studying. And, um, the, you know, the root of um, applying and sending your work to competitions is sort of, you know, a, is a way of getting yourself attention and getting agents. And I know a couple of authors from last year, you know, ended up getting really big deals from getting shortlisted even just in, in that award. So it, had, it can have a massive impact on your career. Um, you already we're on that road and with the novel all clearly already uh, ready to go out and submitted and accepted and, and ready to be coming. I wonder um, do you feel then that it um, had an impact on your work or that it has given you a different gaze um, of how much you're going to now look at your writing or has it, is it just a separate thing over here you know um, it has affected the second novel a lot because the first novel is kind of a hard book to read. It's not, a, it's kind of a bit of a, a very literary book. And the second one is literary, but it's a little bit more, um, it's a little bit easier to read. Um, I don't know how to explain. I feel like I was, I, I kind of started enjoying writing something quite funny to like make things that are a little bit, light-hearted rather than hugely earnest so my approach then because that I felt that was rewarded with the short story prize because that was supposed to be a funny story so I thought oh that's maybe I can do I can do kind of funny sarcastic slightly ironic writing as well as like intensely earnest writings so it did it did give me confidence with the second novel to be a bit more of a light touch but I suppose when I'm I, after that I might not write like that again I don't really know I am trying to change a bit as a writer or evolve a bit because I think when you're starting out, for me anyway, I was like writing the same thing or studies of the same thing for years, going back over and revisiting it. And then when it got published, that was it. That was the expression of that moment of my life. And now I don't want to write that moment again and again. I want to write something new. So it's been like a dividing point between novel one and novel two. Yeah. Um, can, and, um, um, I was talking to them, Kathy Galvin, the founder, the co-founder of um, that award, and um, um, she um, has a big, a great love of Irish writers in particular, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I know that you were a judge uh, for this prize, the very prize that uh, Neve uh, won, but not that year, it was the year that Danielle McGough, am I right, Danielle yeah. McGough? Yes, yeah. had these kind of two Irish writers running, you know, winning quite close together as well. So, is there is there something about the Irish 
you know <laughs> and if so what is it what, what's what's the secret what's the thing uh, i mean i i do think there is a particular feel that the irish have the short story don't ask me what it is i mean i'm sure someone could do a phd on it um, but there is definitely, the, the year that I um, judged it, there were, I mean, really strong Irish showing in the, the long list, really strong and the short list, and obviously Danielle won. Um, and there is a lyricism in the language. And as, as you'll know, I mean, if I think about my grandmother, she could tell you she went to the shop and it was poetry. And it was beautiful. And it was an event. It wasn't, I went to the shop for the potatoes. She said, listen to this. And it will be, I went to the shop for the potatoes. I saw her. I did this. And it was cold. And now I'm home. And she would make this very ordinary thing through beautiful language into something worth listening to, even though it was a quite a mundane event. She would embroider it. Of course, half of it didn't happen. Um, but it was just the way that she'd talk about it and she'd tell you to bring some excitement into a life, to have the crack, to make you laugh. And I do think that's a particularly Irish thing. That It doesn't matter whether it's true or not, but listen, listen to how I'm going to tell you about this event. Um, the year that I judged it last year, never again. I mean, you never want to pick up a pen. You're reading brilliant story after brilliant story after brilliant story. And it could really, were I not a good bit older, if I'd read this when I was a younger writer, younger coming to the craft of writing, I'd never write again. The standard is so high. There's such genius on show. There are sentences that I can remember from Danielle, uh, Danielle's story, from other stories that I wrote, where I was just like, oh, my God. The talent is incredible. Um, and it's a great privilege anyway to read and to judge another writer's work. You know, you're, you're being entrusted with something. And I've entered many competitions over the years. And, you know, you, there's a lot of hope. You know, you send these stories off and you hope. Uh, and even if you don't think you're going to win, you still hope and you check the post and you check the shortlist date. And, you know, it's, it's a big thing and it matters a great deal. Even if you're a really well-published writer, any prize, even a long listing or whatever, it really counts and it matters. So, you you know, you're very aware when you're a judge that you've got someone's hopes and dreams, you've got their work in your hands and it, it makes you humble. You know, it should do. It should make you humble and, and, and realise your privilege. But like I say, you do have to then put it away and realise that you've still got to keep going, even though you have now read the best story in the world and your writing's not going to come up to scratch. Um, it's, it's a great thing to do. And just, just before we leave that topic, um, I just thought, again, for um, just thinking of these writers in mind here, here listening to you two, um, um, what makes a short story stand out? You know, you know, if you're reading 400 or, you know, yeah. 50 amazing ones, you know, how do you get down to one, you know? So I'm just thinking, like, how, what happens, you know, that... Yeah. Do, do you are you do you have like a an idea in your head of what you're looking for, or is it just something that just comes and grabs you? And how did it work? Um, I think I think for me it's something that that Neve said. But I can't stand something that's overworked. I can't stand something that's so slick and proud of itself and clever and doing all these gymnastic tricks. I can't bear it. I would rather have the simplest story. Um, that came from somebody's heart or it just got belly, you know, it's got something to it that you think you're seeing something new about the world or you're, you're a character that doesn't leave you. And also, as well for me, the, the, the story that you think about when you've put it down. So you've put that story down, you're going to pick up another one and actually you can't read the one that you're trying to read because that one hasn't left you alone. Mm -hmm. And that's, I, I don't think there's any subject matter. I personally don't enjoy fantasy. Um, so I find it hard to read science fiction and fantasy, but every year I judge the Costa short story award and there's always fantasy and some of it, you know, is, is, is great storytelling. Um, but I always do look for something 
that kicks me in the gut. Doesn't have to be clever, doesn't have to have great, long, beautiful sentences, but it has to have humanity. That's what I always look for first. Uh, Nee, when you read for for pleasure, when you're reading or 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 for inspiration, um, short story writers, um, would who would you name? Who would you recommend? Who would you turn to? Um, any names for us? Um, see, it wouldn't be my primary reading area either, so I'm a little bit embarrassed about that um, because I'm not a short story writer and I don't identify as a short story writer and read other short story writers for tips. I identify as a novelist, but because I spent so long on McGahern, he is the one writer who all of his short stories I have read and he has... Um, he has one or two that are just so perfectly just brilliant um, that I would consider them models. Um, I never got over The Dead by James Joyce. I think I read that at a very impressionable age. It would have been 12 or 13 and it went into my bones and I read it every single Christmas Eve and I've never gotten over it. And it just, that's also like a God, but um, I actually quite enjoy Philip O'Kelly um, in terms of a short story writer who is kind of sort of got a bit finessey, but, but also I really like the humour in the work. So um, he would be another one. And um, I definitely was quite influenced by A Portable Virgin by Anne Enright, which I know I read as an undergrad and was quite struck by. Um, so those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. But I, I certainly wouldn't be au fait with the latest necessarily yeah. short story. Get to, who are your faves? Or who do um, you- the, well, I don't even know if it's a short story, actually. I think it's a novella, The Old Man and the Suit. Mm. A suit, The Old Man and the Sea, um, by um, Hemingway. And it's one, it's a story that, again, as Neve said, it got into my bones. And I read this story maybe for the first time, maybe about eight years ago. And it was, I didn't actually read it. I heard it read by, as an audio book by Donald Sutherland. And it was just in a collection. And I sort of, at the end, I I stopped and I rewound it. And then I stopped at the end and I rewound it. And I thought, how's he doing this thing? There is barely a two-syllable word in it. The words are so simple, you would not believe it. It's like, uh, this man is called the man all the way through. He never gets a name. uh, And there's a boy. And it's, the man did this and the boy did that. The man did this and the boy did that. It was dark, it was light, it was cold, he was fishing. It was literally sort of nursery rhyme language, nursery rhyme vocabulary. It was unbelievable. I mean, I, I was just blown away by it, still am. It's one of those where, you, you know, you read it and you're humbled as a writer because it's, it's deceptive, obviously. It looks like it's this nursery rhyme. And like all the best nursery rhymes, tells you something very profound about life. Um, I'm, we are going to um, have a second reading, which um, I'm delighted um, that for this evening. And um, um, I think, Neve, would you like to go first this time? Okay. I'm going enjoy- to read, sorry, the midsection of a story, which is uh, in five dials. And it, it's a couple of years old. This was a story that I wrote to commission. So it has the unusual, um, it's unusual in that it's a short story I sat down to write as a short story and found very difficult. But in order to get over that task, I the middle section is kind of just a pure riff. Um, and the reason I wanted to read it is because it links up a little bit with Love Many in that it's, um, it's a, the midsection is about, um, in, in Love Many, there's a mentions of hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic drugs the midsection of this story is a hallucinogenic high narrated. So I've always been quite sort of pleased with it because it crystallizes a lot of my interests in, in archetypes and so on. So I'm going to read that. And um, let's pull it up here. This is from Oblivion. When she was high, a crude synaptic stutter occurred and she found herself trapped in an unfolding moment, a single moment, for the guts of an hour, and it was absurd. In this moment, she wrote, I became a fetus, powder pink and shrank into myself. I could feel my knees on the flesh of my belly. I was reborn like a person snapping out of a dream with a gasp of air 
and the bucket before me I wanted to puke and the trails of sweat left by my fingers against the linoleum floor the bucket before and I wanted to puke but it wouldn't come. So I buckled and moaned and relented and became a fetus, powder pink, again, in a chamber of luminous skin. I awoke with a gasp like a person snapping out of a dream to the bucket before me I wanted to puke, and the skids of sweat shrinking away from the linoleum. But no matter what, I couldn't throw up. I thought that vomit would put a stop to it. You cannot imagine how nauseous I felt. I am sick just thinking of it, but that wasn't even the half of it. She wrote, listen to this. When it cleared, I slid into the ritual circle and cried because I felt ashamed of myself. I slid on my thighs in the short denim dress that had become an orphan's attire, a white pinafore. As a part of my hallucination of May Day procession, I carried a sacred heart then, and my hair was cut bluntly across my forehead. And this was in the 19th century, and there was a nun I admired in the choir. Earlier, that was earlier in the high. Now I just slid to the centre and wept. Now I felt derelict. I don't know why I went into the centre of the ritual. I think that I wanted an audience or help. I could say it was high, but there was such a logic to it, a logic I couldn't verbalise, but which lassoed me into the centre and enclosed me like a bell. Both the sound of a bell and the shape of a bell. A cave of misty flickers. Anyway, I became convinced of certain things, on two occasions, actually. On two occasions, she wrote, during this controlled high, I became convinced or became aware that the previous year of my life, of our lives, of your life and my life, did not occur, but in fact had been fabricated by my fancy for the purposes of pedagogical hallucination, which is to say prophecy, for example, which is to say a kind of dumb show on the wall of the cave or a parable encoding cautions, acting as a cautionary tale, saying, this is not how to live a year of your life. This is not how to be. You see? What generosity. My mouth fell open. This was a trope. And I saw my palms shining upwards like the empty pages of a copy book. And when I went outside, the world was almost goadingly harmonious. Fields behind the fences stretched to a sculpture of cloud and a copse of absolutely erect evergreens, tapering monumentally against the blue sky, And I knew that they had been placed there by calculation to create balance, whether by a landscape or or God or Gaia or even Cali, with people standing about in equal proportion as the musicians played canon in D. It was very much like an 18th century pleasure garden. I began to think that the trees and the sky were actually trompe loyal, and I felt that this was sinister but articulate. But when the pastel bell swelled, she explained, it became too much, geezering through me, and I threw my arms out, cruciform. When the pastel bell began to fold up, it was embarrassed for me, fixed in a smile of condescension, so that I felt self-conscious. The fact that the year had in fact happened, the previous year of my life and your life, of our lives, the shady places where our lives have intersected, settled into me firmly, and then I was depressed. I felt very depressed, I sat listlessly watching trees sift into lizards and Rorschach tests for the rest of the afternoon. It was terrible. I think about it now and I have to sit back from the page where I sit at the kitchen table of my apartment facing the railway and the park. The trees of the park are not transforming into anything. They bloom as bulbous and charmless as brassicas. The mountains are soft scoops of navy and bays, the sky a self-loathing grey. Every day comes to this, she wrote, a reckoning. She underlined reckoning several times and provided a sketch of the tapering trees and the trom Lyell arrangement with musical notes that looked like something drawn by a school child and wrote, see watercolour attached. I'll leave it there. Thank you. And Nave, where can we read that? Did you say five dials? Yeah, it's online. You can actually find that one. It's not paywalled. Because I, I do remember that um, they have issues and, um, you know, you could, could, could is, do you, you don't happen to know the number of the issue that it's in or? Um... Uh, yes, let me just look. It's uh, about two years old at this point. So I hadn't published much when this came out. I actually can't see what issue it is, but if you just, the name it, of the story I... is Oblivion. So. Okay, brilliant. Okay. And, and also just, you know, because I know, 
um, your collection um, is still building. So I was just wondering, do you have like a couple of go-to stories that you could direct people to go and read? Because I'm sure after tonight, people are going to really want to go and have a look at your stories. And so I just wondered if you might direct them to a couple. Um, they're in, they're quite scattered. There's uh, two in the Dublin Review. There's an early Dublin Review one um, called Fleshlight, which was one of the first ones I published. And there's an early one in Banshee called Pro-Choice Supper Club, which is an early one too. And there's one forthcoming in a British publication called Some Such Stories, which is called The Karmic Archive. So they're not centred in one place. Most of them are in journals. <laughs> they're not that easy to find. All right. Well, thank you very much for that anyway. Um, Kit, would you read us a second um, story? And it, it, will this be a full one as well, or is this an extract? No, it's going to be part of a story from the collection. Okay. Do you want to introduce uh, a little bit first? I will. So this is Margaret McNaughton, who is a character from The Trick to Time. She's William's aunt, who's called Pestilence. Uh, and it's set before William leaves Claren Bridge in Galway for England. It's actually before he's born, very shortly before he's born. In 1952, the drinking curse appeared from nowhere and took hold in Quilty John McNaughton like cancer. For generations, the family had shunned spirits, wine and beer, and instead... To toast special occasions, they took water with a tip of blackcurrant syrup for colour. Even at 15 years old, Quilty McNaughton and little Joe Kelly were hospitalised on a bottle of stolen John Jameson 12-year-old single malt. And while little Joe was discharged three days later, having learnt his lesson, Quilty acquired, along with a taste for hard liquor, a less and less discerning palate so that by 20 years old, Potsheen had stripped the skin from his lips. His alcoholism could not be beaten from him by his father, nor exercised by the priest. And Quilty was beautiful. He had thick hair, the colour of new milk, and eyes of the brightest blue, like someone held a lantern behind each one. Lying on his back on a bale of hay, as lean and strong as good timber, with his farm boy tan, you'd be forgiven for thinking he was an angel, resting on his wings, temporarily lost, or taking a breather from the execution of God's work on a Sunday afternoon. But his sisters knew better. Always and in every way, they gave Quilty a wide berth. Drunk or sober, there was an ugly meanness about him. He'd come home after a day in the fields, spitting and raging, cursing the stroke that had twisted his father's limbs, bemoaning the premature burden that made Quilty man of the house, farmhand and harvester all in one. He would wash at the pump and drip dirty water through the kitchen, spear the meat on his plate as though it had wronged him, and gobble the potatoes down in three bites. As soon as he'd finished, as there was never a drink in the house, he would set off, hands in pockets, kicking an unfortunate stone the whole two miles to Horan's tavern and afterwards crawl home to sleep it off in the barn. The girls had learnt long ago to bolt the door against him. The McNaughton household had resigned themselves to this life. The father to shuffling around the yard doing women's work. The two sisters to Quilty's bullying ingratitude when again, out of nowhere, Quilty fell in love with Horan's daughter, Evelyn. Almost overnight, where he'd been sour and angry, Quilty became optimistic and easygoing, pretty-mouthed and calm. Evelyn hated the smell of the drink that saturated the stone walls of the pub and rose by osmosis up to the little flat above the bar. She despised the drunken fools that roared with laughter night after night beneath her bedroom, spending the rent, the housekeeping, the price of their children's shoes, while the till sang her a one-note lullaby. Quilty promised her sobriety, and she promised him everlasting love. After the wedding, Evelyn moved to the farm and helped around the house. She made jam and meat pies, she fed the chickens, washed the linen, 
and walked out to the late after, in the late afternoon to meet her husband halfway. In his absence, she talked to him, talked about him to his sisters. Do you know what he said to me, Margaret? He said he has his eye on the cottage by the south field, the one that overlooks the bay. With my money and what he'll save, he said that we'll have it one day. When the children come, we will. Or while she was making soda bread with Teresa, she'd use a bit of the dough and shape it into a heart, mark it with a cue and say, that'll make him smile. The sisters in turn embroidered her tablecloths and aprons. They braided her auburn hair and took their father on day trips to the seaside or to Galway town each Saturday to give the lovers some privacy. On Sundays, strangest of all, Quilty and his father would sing old songs together in harmony. On Raglan Road, Four Green Fields, The Ferryman, with Evelyn balancing a little accordion on her lap and tapping her delicate shoe to keep time. The house and the hens grew fat under the extra love and care. When Evelyn became pregnant, with Quilty working long hours to save for their cottage, the sisters sewed in earnest, bibs and shawls and smocks for mother and child. They gathered all the extra crockery in the house and began stockpiling preserves. They estimated window sizes and stitched heavy curtains against the damp sea air and listened in silence while the parents discussed baby names. Both grandfathers were christened Thomas, which was an old fashioned name, and there was nothing else good enough in either bloodline. This child would be special. When Evelyn went into labor, Margaret sent Teresa running for Mrs. Lewis. Quilty's father took his place by the range, trying as best as he could to keep two pots and a kettle on the boil in readiness. Quilty was at the market in Clarenbridge. The special boy was born at three o'clock in the afternoon. The house was quiet when Quilty opened the kitchen door. Hello, he called. He saw Mrs. Lewis first and looked from her to the family, all standing in a huddle around the crib. Why had it been brought down into the kitchen? And where was his wife? Thank you very much. Thank you, Kits. And we've come perfect timing to the end of our hour together. Um, I want to uh, thank um, Kit and me very much. Thank you very much for um, a wonderful evening, for um, answering your questions very um, openly and honestly, and, uh, and, and also for those beautiful readings as well. Mm -hmm.